the realm of organized crime, numerous formidable figures have emerged, leaving an enduring impact marked by unbridled brutality. Over the years, the once overtly violent mafia bosses have given way to more discreet and businesslike enterprises. However, even in 2023, the legacies of infamous individuals persist, with one name standing out among the rest, Matteo M. Dinaro. Matteo M. Dinaro wasn't just a mob boss, he was diabolical, a name whispered with both reverence and fear throughout the dark alleys of Sicily. His story begins in Castle Vetrano, Sicily in April 1962, under the watchful eye of his father, Francesco, known as Donio, the head of the Sicilian Cosa Nostra Mafia in the Trapani region. From a young age, Matteo was immersed in the Mafia lifestyle, groomed to wield a gun by the age of 14 and allegedly committing his first murder by 18. His criminal journey, marked by violence and ruthlessness, was only beginning. One of the most chilling chapters in Matteo M. Dinaro's saga was his involvement in the 1992 killing of prosecutor Giovanni Falcone. Falcone met a tragic end in an assassination bombing orchestrated by the Mafia. The horror continued when, in a sinister move to prevent Mafia turncoat Santino D'Amato from testifying, Matteo's 11-year-old son was kidnapped. For 779 harrowing days, the innocent child was held hostage by a group that tortured him relentlessly before ultimately strangling him to death. Matteo M. Dinaro found himself entangled in an act of cruelty that sent shockwaves throughout Sicily and beyond. The merciless hands that perpetrated this crime dissolved the child's remains in acid, leaving a haunting legacy of brutality and cruelty that would forever be associated with Matteo M. Dinaro. Mesa Dinaro's criminal notoriety extended beyond the tragic events of his son's kidnapping and murder. In 1993, he was held responsible for orchestrating a series of bombings in Rome, Florence and Milan, resulting in the deaths of 10 people and injuries to 93 others. As a key player in the Cosa Nostra's ruthless strategy, he aimed to force the Italian state into retreat, casting a sinister shadow of death and destruction over Italy. Matteo M. Denaro's body count was immeasurable, and rumors circulated that he once boasted, I filled a cemetery all by myself. Amid Italy's turmoil in the summer of 1993, as the Mafia unleashed a reign of terror, Miss Denaro vanished into thin air. His disappearance coincided with the arrest of former Mafia top boss, Salvatore Reina. At this point, Miss Denaro joined the ranks of the most wanted criminals globally, earning a spot on Forbes' list of the 10 most wanted and powerful criminals in the world in 2010. As years turned into decades, Miss Denaro remained elusive, a phantom lurking in the shadows. His life as a fugitive was far from miserable. Shielded by fellow mobsters who tipped him off about impending police raids, he played video games, entertained numerous girlfriends, and enjoyed a life that seemed untouched by the law. The code of silence, Omerta, was sacrosanct to his supporters and compliant townspeople who never revealed his whereabouts, despite close calls and false dawns for the police. In 2021, an unfortunate Formula One fan from Liverpool was mistakenly arrested by Dutch police, who believed him to be Miss Dinaro. However, the elusive mob boss continued to evade capture until a twist of fate in January 2023. After 30 years of life as a fugitive, Miss Dinaro was finally arrested in Sicily by Italian police. His capture mirrored the arrest of Salvatore Reina almost exactly three decades earlier, marking the end of Miss Dinaro's reign as perhaps the last Mafia secret keeper. Investigators confirmed his illness, necessitating treatment at a Palermo clinic, ultimately bringing an end to his elusive and notorious criminal career. The arrest of Miss Dinaro unfolded with over 100 members of the armed forces involved. Found at a private clinic receiving treatment for colon cancer, he had reportedly used a fake name during his chemotherapy visits. Italian media estimated his assets to be worth a staggering 4 billion EUR at the time of his arrest. During the night, Miss Dinaro was covertly transported to the prison of Lila under the Article 41 Biz Prison regime. This particular prison, equipped with an oncology ward, was the closest facility to Rome where he could be interrogated by Italian magistrates. Despite being apprehended, the world would never hear his side of the story in a courtroom. In a dramatic turn of events on September 24, 2023, Miss Dinaro slipped into an irreversible coma. 
As the world watched, he passed away in the early hours of September 25, 2023, taking all his secrets to the grave. Salvatore Toto Rina, known as The Beast, enters the narrative as another ruthless mafia boss with a notorious criminal history. Born in 1930 in the impoverished village of Corleone, Rina's early life was marked by tragedy when his father inadvertently set off a bomb, claiming lives and leaving his brother scarred. Rina's journey to infamy began with a 12-year prison term for taking a life in a heated brawl in 1956. Released in 1958, Rina's spirit remained unbroken. The Corleone Mafia family, under Michela Navarra until 1958, witnessed a power shift orchestrated by Luciano Leggio, leading to Navarra's violent demise. Reina, along with Calogero Bagarella and Bernardo Provenzano, played crucial roles in this shift, propelling the rise of the Corleone Mafia. Reina's criminal notoriety grew as he orchestrated the deaths of judges, policemen, prosecutors, and anyone deemed a rival to his criminal enterprise. Rina's path to infamy was marked by violence and ruthlessness, and his criminal empire thrived as he climbed the ranks of the Mafia. The intricate details of Rina's criminal exploits and his impact on the criminal landscape unfolded over the years, making him a formidable and feared figure in the world of organized crime. In the early 1960s, as arrest warrants loomed, Rina and his associates went into hiding to evade the impending legal repercussions for a series of murders. Despite facing trial in 1969 for earlier killings, Reina and Leggio managed to escape conviction due to jury intimidation. Reina, however, continued to elude authorities for the next 23 years. With Leggio incarcerated in 1974, Reina seized control of the Corleone Mafia, steering them toward unprecedented power. He formed alliances with the Andretta and the Calabrian Mafia, counting on influential figures like Domenico Trippo as close associates. The 1980s marked a heralded period as Reina initiated the Second Mafia War. His primary rivals, Stefano Bontad, Salvatore Inzerillo, and Tano Badalamenti, were mercilessly eliminated, with up to a thousand lives claimed in the brutal conflict. The Corleone, led by Reina, emerged as the undisputed rulers of the Mafia after successfully wiping out their rivals. Unlike his predecessors who excelled at hiding in the shadows, Reina chose a different approach, opting to unleash a reign of terror. Orchestrating the murders of judges, policemen and prosecutors, Reina defied law enforcement efforts to combat the Mafia. The much-delayed Law's Law, enacted in 1982 after the murder of Judge Law, aimed to curb the Mafia's influence. However, Reina's ruthlessness continued unabated. The year 1982 witnessed further tragedies with the assassination of Carlo Alberto Dalla Chiesa, a general tasked with crushing the Mafia, along with his wife and driver bodyguard. In response to mounting public outrage and escalating violence, Law's Law marked a turning point in the fight against organized crime. Reina's ruthlessness knew no bounds, he targeted high-profile mafioso Busetta and his family, unleashing a relentless wave of violence. Busetta's sons, brothers, son-in-law and nephews all fell victim to Reina's merciless vendetta. Cornered and devastated, Busetta made the fateful decision to cooperate with Italian authorities. His revelations shattered the myth of the Mafia's decentralization, unveiling the existence of a single organization led by a commission with the top echelons complicit in all its crimes. Reina's criminal enterprise was exposed, and the fight against organized crime took a decisive turn with the unraveling of these revelations. In an attempt to divert attention from Busetta's explosive disclosures, Reina sanctioned the Christmas Massacre of 1984. The horrific Train 94 bombing claimed 17 lives and left 267 wounded. Initially attributed to political extremists, it was ultimately revealed as the handiwork of the Mafia. The wave of terror reached its zenith in 1992 when Judge Giovanni Falcone, his wife Francesca Morio, and three police officers perished in the Capaci bombing. Two months later, Judge Paolo Borsellino and five police officers were slain in a car bomb attack in Viadilio. Reina masterminded both atrocities, seeking to destabilize the judicial system. These heinous crimes ignited public outrage and prompted the Italian government to launch an unprecedented crackdown on the Mafia. 
Reyna was sentenced to life in prison for the murders of Falcone and Borsellino, but his reign of terror was far from over. On a fateful day in January 1993, Carabinieri officers apprehended Reyna at his Palermo villa, ending his 23-year fugitive status. The beast was finally in captivity, but the scars of his brutality would forever haunt Sicily. Salvatore Reyna's story is one of unbridled ambition, unrelenting violence, and the resilience of those who dared to defy the darkness of the Mafia. In the gritty streets of Brooklyn where the shadows concealed horrors beyond imagination, a name struck fear into the hearts of all who heard it, Roy Albert Deo. Roy's journey into the underworld began in the heart of Flatlands, Brooklyn, born in 1940 to Italian immigrants. He came from humble beginnings, and the streets of Brooklyn raised him. By the time he graduated from James Madison High School in 1959, he was already making a name for himself as a loan shark. However, Deo's path was destined for something far darker. He was soon drawn into the labyrinthine world of organized crime, initially aligning with the Flatlands Canary faction of the Lucchese crime family. They controlled everything from tow truck companies to car theft operations in Brooklyn, a world where Roy would thrive. His fortunes changed when Anthony Gaggi, a soldier in the Gambino crime family, saw potential in him. Gaggi convinced Roy to join the Gambinos, promising even greater wealth and power. With this shift, Deo's rise truly began, and he assembled a crew that would become infamous both in the underworld and among law enforcement. The DeMio crew was a deadly mix of young, ruthless men, among them Chris Rosenberg, just 16 when he crossed paths with Roy. Rosenberg's entry marked the crew's genesis, soon followed by a roster of cold-blooded associates, including Joseph and Patrick Anthony, and others. As the 1970s unfolded, the crew's actions grew increasingly gruesome. Their signature method of execution, known as the Gemini Method, was born in the dark corners of the Gemini Lounge, their hideout. Victims were lured into the lounge, shot in the head, almost always by Roy himself, and stabbed in the heart to ensure a swift end. Stabbing in the heart also stopped more blood from flowing out. The gunshot wound meant the victim would be placed in the bathroom, where the blood would drain out to reduce the messiness of what came next. The bodies were then dismembered, their parts meticulously concealed and disposed of in plastic bags and cardboard boxes. The Gemini Lounge, once a hub of criminal activity, became a chilling slaughterhouse where victims met their gruesome fate and the crew honed their mob craft. Not all victims met the same fate. Some were left in the streets, their lifeless forms serving as a warning to those who dared to oppose the crew. People who weren't subjected to the grim fate of dismemberment, such as Roy's old friend Rosenberg, who betrayed a Cuban drug deal, leading to the murder of a Cuban man and his associates. Fearing reprisals from the Cuban cartel, Deo hesitated but eventually obeyed orders to eliminate Rosenberg. Then came the chilling public murder of an innocent college student, Dominic Rucci, mistaken for a Cuban hitman. Rucci was chased and shot dead by Deo, who, burdened by guilt, fled with his family. Gaggi, outraged, demanded Rosenberg's death to prevent more innocent victims. On a chilling night in 1979, the fate of Chris Rosenberg was sealed as he unsuspectingly walked into the trap set within the confines of the Gemini Clubhouse. Roy Dio, the orchestrator of countless malevolent acts, pulled the trigger. But hesitation gripped him when Rosenberg didn't immediately succumb. Another member of the crew stepped in to finish the job. Uncharacteristically, the lifeless body of Rosenberg was left in the open. A deliberate act as dictated by the Cubans, ensuring that his death would capture headlines and send a message. The repercussions of Rosenberg's murder resonated deeply with Deo, plunging him into a profound sense of grief that isolated him from his crew for days. Yet the crew's reign of terror pressed on, and their actions were soon met with opposition. A conflict arose with Andre Katz, a young proprietor of an auto repair shop, who, under duress, revealed the inner workings of the crew to the authorities. This revelation set the stage for a harrowing confrontation, resulting in Katz's demise in a manner both gruesome and terrifying, stabbed, decapitated, and crushed. As law enforcement closed in on the Deo crew, the extent of their malevolence became shockingly clear. The victims, disposed of methodically, found their final resting place in the Fountain Avenue dump, their remains buried beneath tons of refuse, 
an eerie testament to the crew's systematic brutality. In the waning days of Roy Deo's tyrannical rule, paranoia consumed him. Faced with the looming specter of death, he contemplated a desperate act, faking his own demise. On January 10, 1983, he attended a clandestine meeting with his associates, never to be seen again by his family. Ten days later, law enforcement discovered Deo's abandoned Cadillac, a foreboding sign of the tragedy that had befallen him. Upon opening the trunk, authorities were met with the chilling sight of Deo's lifeless body, partially frozen and riddled with gunshot wounds. The once feared orchestrator of horrors was silenced forever. The conclusion of Roy Albert Dio's reign of terror left in its wake a trail of unspeakable crimes that would eternally haunt the annals of criminal history. The Gemini Method, the crew's distinctive and ghastly signature, cast a long shadow over the dark underbelly of Brooklyn. It serves as a haunting reminder of the malevolence that can fester in the shadows and the inevitable reckoning that awaits those who dare to plunge into the abyss of such ruthless criminality. Roy Albert Deo's story unfolds as a chilling chronicle of unbridled ambition, relentless violence, and the eventual comeuppance of a man whose name once struck fear into the hearts of all who heard it. Vito Genovese's origins trace back to Rigliano, Italy, where he was born on November 21, 1897. The son of Francis Felice Genovese and Nuna Alotto, he grew up with a sister and two brothers, Michael and Carmine, both of whom would later become integral parts of Genovese's criminal empire. In 1913, at the age of 15, Genovese's life took a pivotal turn when his family embarked on a journey across the Atlantic, seeking a new life in the United States. Their arrival in Little Italy, Manhattan, marked the beginning of a journey that would see the unassuming teenager rise to shape the American Mafia. Genovese's criminal apprenticeship commenced with petty thefts from pushcart vendors and running errands for mobsters. These early experiences served as the crucible in which his criminal prowess was forged. Gradually, he transitioned to more lucrative criminal activities, such as collecting money from illicit lotteries. Trouble, however, was never far behind. At the age of 19, Genovese found himself incarcerated for a year due to illegal possession of a firearm. This setback proved to be a mere blip in his criminal journey. The 1920s, marked by the era of prohibition, offered Genovese new opportunities. He found himself in the employ of Joe the Boss Masseria, a powerful gang leader, alongside emerging figures like Lucky Luciano and Frank Costello. The trio delved into bootlegging, capitalizing on the prohibition to amass both wealth and power. Yet, it was a counterfeiting operation in 1930 that nearly spelled Genovese's doom. Law enforcement uncovered a staggering $1 million in counterfeit currency in a Brooklyn workshop linked to him, adding to his notoriety. In the same year, Genovese allegedly committed a chilling act that set the stage for his ascent. Gano B. Reyna, a Bronx-based gang leader and Masseria ally, fell under suspicion of aiding Masseria's arch-rival, Salvatore Maranzano. On February 26, 1930, Reyna was ambushed and brutally shot in the head with a shotgun. Genovese assumed direct control of Reyna's gang, consolidating his power. As the Castella Marie's war raged on, Genovese's loyalty shifted. A secret pact between Luciano and Maranzano spelled the end for Masseria, marking a crucial turning point in the tumultuous landscape of organized crime in the United States. Vito Genovese's journey from a humble immigrant to a key figure in the American Mafia unfolded against the backdrop of shifting allegiances, power struggles, and criminal enterprises that defined the era. On April 15, 1931, Joe Masseria met his demise at a restaurant on Coney Island in a cunningly orchestrated and frustrated hit. Vito Genovese played a pivotal role in this audacious murder alongside notable figures such as Albert Anastasia, Joe Adonis, and Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. With Masseria out of the picture, Charles' lucky Luciano ascended, with Genovese by his side as a trusted underboss. However, the bloodshed was far from over. In September 1931, Luciano and Genovese devised a plan to eliminate Salvatore Maranzano, who had become a significant threat. Sensing danger when Maranzano summoned them to a meeting, Luciano and Genovese preemptively struck, dispatching Jewish gangsters to eliminate Maranzano. 
This strategic move solidified their control and laid the foundation for the creation of the Commission, the governing body of organized crime. Genovese's personal life mirrored the turbulence of his criminal career. After his first wife, Donata Ron, succumbed to tuberculosis, he married Anna Patillo. The circumstances surrounding this union raised eyebrows, as Anna was previously married to Gerard Vernotico, whose life ended in strangulation. Genovese's involvement in this murder remained shrouded in secrecy. In a bid to legitimize his power, Genovese orchestrated a national Cosa Nostra meeting, famously known as the Appalachian Meeting in New York. This gathering aimed to solidify the syndicate's grip on various criminal activities, from narcotics to gambling. However, law enforcement suspicions turned the meeting into chaos as mafiosi scrambled to evade capture. Genovese's grand ambitions eventually led to his undoing. He faced indictment on narcotics conspiracy charges in 1959, aided by the questionable testimony of a Puerto Rican drug dealer. Despite receiving a 15-year prison sentence, Genovese continued to exert control over his crime family from behind bars. To this day, the legitimacy of Genovese's conviction remains a subject of debate among detectives, lawyers, and organized crime experts. Vito Genovese's life story is a riveting narrative of crime, power, and the intricate web of the Mafia. His journey from orchestrating pivotal moments in the American Mafia's history to his eventual imprisonment paints a vivid picture of a man whose influence extended far beyond the confines of prison walls. Charles Lucky Luciano is a name synonymous with the American Mafia, and his life unfolds like a riveting noir tale, woven across continents and fueled by ambition, cunning, and ruthlessness. Born Salvatore Lucania on November 24, 1897, in Lercara Fridi, Sicily, Italy, Luciano's early years gave no indication of the notorious figure he would become. His parents, Antonio Lucania and Rosalia Caparelli, struggled financially, with Antonio working in a sulfur mine to support the family. In April 1906, at the age of eight, Luciano and his family embarked on a transformative journey leaving Sicily behind for the United States. Their destination was the Lower East Side of Manhattan, a hub for Italian immigrants seeking a new life. Luciano's American story unfolded rapidly. At 14, he dropped out of school and took a job delivering hats, earning a meager $7 per week. However, fate intervened when a $244 windfall in a dice game propelled him into the world of street life. Luciano's journey led him to the Brooklyn Trenny School due to his truancy and delinquency. Amidst the chaos of New York streets, he established his gang and joined the infamous Five Points Gang. However, his approach was unconventional. Instead of engaging in petty crimes, Luciano offered protection services to Jewish youths for a modest fee of 10 cents per week and ventured into the world of pimping. During this turbulent period, Luciano's path intersected with another rising star, Meyer Lansky. Their initial encounter was marked by tension as Luciano attempted to extort protection money from Lansky. However, Lansky's defiance forged an enduring partnership between them. The origins of Luciano's nickname Lucky remain shrouded in mystery, with various theories circulating. Some attributed to his survival of a brutal assault, while others connected to his gambling fortune or a simple mispronunciation of his last name. Luciano's criminal record was extensive, with 25 arrests between 1916 and 1936, yet he consistently managed to evade significant prison time, leaving law enforcement perplexed. The dawn of prohibition in 1920 marked a pivotal point in Luciano's criminal career. The 18th Amendment's ban on alcohol created the perfect conditions for an underground empire, and Luciano seized the opportunity to establish a thriving black market for illicit booze. By 1920, Luciano had intersected with future Mafia luminaries such as Vito Genovese and Frank Costello. Together, they embarked on bootlegging endeavors, seizing the lucrative opportunities presented by Prohibition. Luciano's mentor, Arnold the Brain Rothstein, a prominent gambler, played a pivotal role in honing Luciano's skills in running bootleg alcohol. However, a setback occurred in 1923 when a sting operation revealed Luciano's involvement in selling heroin, tarnishing his reputation. In a strategic move to rehabilitate his image, Luciano purchased 200 premium seats to a high-profile boxing match, distributing them to influential figures. 
This public relations maneuver successfully rescued his standing. Luciano's ascent continued as he became a key player in Joe Masseria's criminal syndicate. The rivalry between Masseria and Salvatore Maranzano escalated into the brutal Castellamare's War. Masseria and Maranzano clung to the old world values of honor, tradition, and respect, refusing collaboration with non-Italians or non-Sicilians. Luciano, however, adopted a forward-thinking approach, willing to work with anyone for profit. Driven by his vision of a unified and lucrative criminal empire, Luciano forged alliances with younger mobsters who shared his perspective. In 1931, Luciano orchestrated the murder of Masseria, switching allegiance to Maranzano in a secret deal that made him second in command. Fortunately for Luciano, a tip from Joe Adonis thwarted a plot to kill him, exposing Masseria's intention to eliminate him. The infamous murder of Masseria took place at Nuova Villa Tamaro, with Luciano allegedly excusing himself to the restroom while gunmen, including Albert Anastasia, Vito Genovese, Joe Adonis, and Benjamin Bugsy Siegel, carried out the hit. The bloodshed didn't end there. In the days that followed, Maranzano's rivals met gruesome fates, with some disappearing without a trace. Luciano's rise to power was undeniable, and Maranzano's death cleared the path for Luciano to ascend as the preeminent crime boss in the United States. He ushered in a new era by dismantling the title of Capo di Tutti Capi to avoid unnecessary power struggles, instead maintaining control through discreet alliances to ensure peace and prosperity within the five families. Luciano's influence extended far beyond the boundaries of traditional organized crime, encompassing various industries such as labor unions, waterfront operations, garbage hauling, construction, the garment district, and trucking. Luciano's criminal empire yielded colossal profits, with the family's income surpassing $12 million annually. Despite reaching the zenith of the criminal underworld, Luciano remained committed to Omerta, the code of silence. He upheld Maranzano's structure of five crime families in New York City and retained the ceremonial made man tradition, following the advice of his close ally Vito Genovese. Salvatore Lucania, known as Lucky Luciano, and Albert Anastasia reshaped organized crime in America. Their vision of a unified syndicate embracing Italian, Jewish, and Irish gangsters transformed criminal activities into lucrative businesses for all involved. Luciano's turbulent journey from Sicily to the mean streets of New York left an indelible mark on the American mafia. His name embodies ambition, cunning, and the enduring allure of organized crime. Now, let's delve into the life of Albert Anastasia, the man nicknamed the Earthquake. Born Umberto Anastasio on September 26, 1902, in the picturesque town of Perelia, Calabria, Italy, he was the son of Bartolo Anastasio and Mariana Polistena. After the tragic death of his father after World War I, Anastasia, along with his brothers Joseph Anthony and Gerardo, embarked on a perilous journey to the United States in 1919. Entering the U.S. illegally, the Anastasia brothers found work as longshoremen on the bustling Brooklyn waterfront. The early 1920s marked a turbulent period in Anastasia's life when, in 1921, he faced a murder conviction for the killing of fellow longshoreman George Torino after a heated dispute. Initially sentenced to death, Anastasia found an unexpected lifeline, a legal technicality that granted him a retrial in 1922 as four key witnesses mysteriously disappeared, leading to his release. During this time, Albert Anastasia decided to change his surname from Anastasio to Anastasia. Despite his brushes with the law, his encounters with murder charges seemed to be plagued by disappearing witnesses and collapsed cases. In 1928, he faced murder charges in Brooklyn, but once again, witnesses vanished leading to the crumble of the case. By the late 1920s, Anastasia had ascended to prominence within the International Longshoremen's Association, ILA, exercising influence over six local chapters in Brooklyn. Anastasia's circle expanded to include future Cosa Nostra powerhouses such as Joe Adonis, Charles Lucky Luciano, Vito Genovese, and Frank Costello. His criminal record continued to accumulate, facing murder charges in 1932 and again the following year. The charges in 1932, related to a murder committed with an ice pick, were dropped due to the absence of witnesses. In 1933, he was accused of killing a laundry worker, 
but witnesses refused to testify. Albert Anastasia's pivotal role in the criminal underworld expanded when lucky Luciano rewarded his loyalty. Luciano appointed Anastasia and Louis Lepke Bucalter as the nation's foremost labor racketeers to lead Murder, Inc., also known as the Brownsville Boys. This notorious group comprised Jewish and Italian contract killers operating from a candy store owned by mobster Louis Capone in Brooklyn's Brownsville neighborhood. Over its 10-year operation, Murder, Inc. committed thousands of murders, most of which remained unsolved. Anastasia earned monikers like the Mad Hatter and the Lord High Executioner for his leadership in this ruthless organization. In May 1939, Anastasia allegedly ordered the murder of Morris Diamond, a Teamsters Union official in Brooklyn who opposed Bacalter's control of the Garment District in Manhattan. Anastasia also orchestrated the killing of Peter Panto, an ILA activist advocating democratic reforms within the Union. Panto's refusal to back down and intimidation attempts led to his disappearance and the subsequent discovery of his body in New Jersey in 1941. The arrest of gang leader Abe Reles, who had supplied Anastasia and Murder, Inc. with hitmen for a decade, marked a turning point in the criminal operations orchestrated by Anastasia. Marked as the beginning of the end for the notorious organization, Albert Anastasia, fearing prosecution, placed a $1,000 bounty on Reles's head. On November 12, 1941, Reles was found dead on a Coney Island restaurant roof. Though officially ruled an accident, suspicions of foul play lingered. In 1942, Anastasia allegedly ordered the murder of an associate, Anthony Romeo, who had been arrested and questioned in the Panto case. By the end of June, Romeo's battered and bullet-riddled body was discovered near Guyan Court, Delaware. Despite being a formidable force in the mob, Anastasia officially held the position of underboss in the Mangano crime family under the leadership of Vincent Mangano. However, their relationship was fraught with tension, as Mangano resented Anastasia's close ties to Luciano and Castello, particularly their recruitment of Anastasia without seeking Mangano's consent. On April 19, 1951, Vincent Mangano disappeared, never to be seen again. The same day, the body of Vincent's brother, Phil, was found in Jamaica Bay. Though no arrests were made, suspicions arose that Anastasia played a role in their demise. Following Mangano's disappearance, Anastasia served as the acting boss of their family, supported by Frank Costello and Joseph Bonanno. Anastasia eventually ascended to the position of boss, renaming the family the Anastasia family. In March 1952, he allegedly ordered the murder of Arnold Schuster, who had identified fugitive bank robber Willie Sutton in a TV interview. Schuster's ruthless killing took place on March 8, 1952, in Borough Park, Brooklyn. While government witness Joseph Valachi accused Anastasia of the murder in 1963, skepticism persisted and no arrests were made. The final chapter of Albert Anastasia's life was written on the morning of October 25, 1957, in a midtown Manhattan barbershop. As Anastasia relaxed in the barber's chair, two gunmen with concealed faces stormed in, firing shots at their unsuspecting target. Anastasia, displaying incredible courage and strength, lunged at his assailants, mistakenly attacking their reflections in the wall mirror. The ruthless gunmen continued their assault until Anastasia lay lifeless on the floor. Albert Anastasia's life, shrouded in violence and mystery, left an enduring imprint on the annals of organized crime.